Welcome to the second episode of 365 Brothers. We're delighted to have you listening. A word of caution. There is a graphic description of gun violence. Please take appropriate precautions with young children who may be listening or anyone who may be suffering from PTSD for whom that kind of description would be inappropriate. Welcome to 365 Brothers. In this episode, we're going to talk to a gentleman who was a photojournalist for 19 years and for the last nine years plus has been a photo editor at one of the largest newspapers in the Gulf Coast area, not including Texas. He has won some amazing awards. For example, he was photographer of the year for the Associated Press and has won numerous National Press Photographers Association Awards. He is a photo editor at The Advocate, and we have the pleasure of talking to Mr. Michael Dunlap. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. It's glad to be here. Thank you. I uh, I, I make sure to make a clarification. I I was the photographer of the year for our region, which is uh, the Louisiana, Mississippi managing editors. uh, Yes. Okay. Share a little bit about yourself. I am originally from the Long Beach area. I am born and raised in basically in that area, but I came out to Louisiana to go to college in 1989. I attended Grambling State University, majored in uh, mass communications, the concentration in visual communications. I okay. uh, have been working, I mean, I was privileged enough to, to get a job in the field and have been working in the state of Louisiana ever since. I started in 1992. And now, now I am a photo editor that works with several different freelancers and uh, regular photographers, uh, staff photographers, that cover New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. Let's jump on in. What's your favorite song right now? I, I struggle with my favorite song because I, I am a big mu- lover of music, but uh, you know, so like you know, my first love is jazz, and uh, Pat Metheny has a song called "Last Train Home," and it always makes me think of my dad. So because my dad, every time he hears it, he stumps his foot. You know, I, I'd probably have to go with that or "Autumn Leaves" by Miles Davis. My my son is named Miles. Uh, when I first heard that, it, that, that song touched my heart. So yeah. And you say. Um, a little bit more about how it touches your heart, that song? If you've heard the song before, it has ver- it has various tempos to it. It starts off slow and it has all these crescendos to it. There's so much passion in it. Like I say, it has different tempos and it, it's all over the place. And the drums with Cannonball Adderley, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And and the other song, like I said, my, my, my dad always with Last Train Home, he says, he th- I guess he thinks I forget, you know, but he always said, man, I just can visualize this train going down these tracks. And if you never heard the song, it's it's beautiful, but it's it's got these drums and it's a, the cymbals. I mean, it's just, you know, like an old choo-choo train. Uh-huh. And that that's the, the base of the song and it, it's beautiful. So I'll go with either of those two songs that, that really make me feel a certain way when I hear them. So. Wow. You know, knowing that you're a photojournalist and how you describe the music, you recognize beauty easily, right? I, yeah, and I've, all, <laughs> I've often been uh, told that, you know, I, I see the beauty in everything, you know, I, I do. I look at things a lot differently than most people do, you know, because I, I, I mean, the actual definition of photography is the study of light. I, I try to look at things and see how I could capture it in the image, in the still image. I do see the beauty in, in the little things. Yeah, that's clear. What is a favorite childhood memory? My mom and dad were in a neighborhood club that was called the Friendly 12 in Carson, Long Beach area. And uh, every Memorial Day, they'd have the, the Friendly 12. It was 12 couples. Initially, it was 12 couples. And every Memorial Day, they'd have this big Memorial Day picnic at El Dorado Park. That was amazing to me. It, 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 I don't know why that every time I think of like these childhood memories, 
that always comes into play. Yeah. Something about those those that day and Memorial Day being so special and it was sad and you know everybody moved on and we don't do that anymore. So when I introduced you, I mentioned a few of your accomplishments. What accomplishment is the most important to you personally? And then the second part is what accomplishment do you find impresses others or that society says that's a great accomplishment? <laughs> You know, it's, it's going to sound kind of uh, cliche, but I've spent a lot of time with my my sons. Honestly, I feel like they're my biggest accomplishment because uh, they are respectful and I think they're really cool kids. It's been a journey, I, but I never had like big issues with them. My oldest just graduated from my alma mater, uh, Grambling. And uh, my youngest just graduated from high school a year ago, but he is thinking about going into the Army. I am an Army National Guard veteran, combat veteran, and my oldest son is a combat, combat veteran as well. Which, um, yeah. which did you serve in and which did he? Both of us were in the National Guard and were deployed to the Army, and uh, I was in Desert Storm. My youngest went to uh, Kuwait and Iraq right when he graduated from high school. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. I know that I love being able to drive up and down the street and I'm not worried about a bomb dropping. I don't worry about those things. I know that's a really blessed life. And so I'm very yeah. appreciative to those who serve. So thank you. I know you said it was kind of trite to say your sons. You said they're cool kids. What about them are you most proud that you've pulled forth from them in your nurture? I have a big thing for respect. And I feel like they're respectful. They know how I feel that uh, as far as men who are bullies or abusive, how they honor women. They both would be like people I would seek out if they, if I didn't know them, I, they, they, they'd be, I'd try to seek out their friendship. I like the way they carry themselves. I'm proud of them. And my wife has, has been, you know, it's, it's been a great time. We've been together since 1990 or 90. Yeah, we, we got married in 93. To me, that, that's been a, a huge accomplishment as well. And, so family. Uh, yeah, family is, is, family is everything to me. Family is, family is everything to me. And the older I get, the more I see that I thrive for it. So, yes. In terms of the accomplishment that impresses others most? <laughs> Didn't realize it till recently. I, d I don't post a lot on my social media. You know, when you're in journalism, contrary to most beliefs, you're not really supposed to have any biases. So I, I don't post anything political or anything like that. But when I do post something to my family, I get so much feedback. Oh, your kids are so great and this and that. That that means a lot to me. The word character, you know, when, when I'm not around, what are my kids doing? How how people look at my, my kids and, and talk about my wife, you know, that means a lot to me. I'm sensing a theme here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good one. And it's a good one. In terms of words, what's a favorite quote, saying, metaphor, or your favorite book? I, I'm a big fan of, of Frederick Douglass. And uh, everyone knows that Frederick Douglass is a, a walking quote, was a walking quote. I, I'd have to, I'm going to say a uh, favorite book. And my family history is from the state of Louisiana. So there's an author that writes basically about old Louisiana, the, the black experience in Louisiana. Ernest Gaines, if you're not familiar with him, you may have yeah. seen some of his movies. Well, there, there's one book uh, called A Gathering of Old Men. It touches my heart, you know, but uh, The Lesson Before Dying was amazing. Every, that's what everybody knows, but A Gathering of, of Old Men is, was, a, was a fantastic book. Basically, there was a, a murder in the quarters, you know, on a plantation where Blacks, blacks live, they call it the quarters. And there was a murder of a white man, Cajun man, in the quarters. And basically all these men showed up with their shotguns uh, because they were questioning about who actually did the shooting. So all these men basically stood up and said, I did it, I did it, I did it. So, uh, yeah. And uh, there was a movie made about it, but uh, the book is amazing. So I, I'll, I'll go with uh, Ernest Gaines. Or anything Ernest Gaines does is, is amazing to me. Is there um, 
something about the way that he writes? I, I get the value in the story itself, but is there also something in the way that he writes that appeals the, to you? Yes. He uses dialect and uh, most of the, it seems like the cities that he uses, those small cities are, are false, you know, but he frames stuff to where if you've been in the region, you, you see it. He writes very visually, very vivid. And they're, they're not long, long books at all. The Diary of Miss Jane Pittman. Just about all the books he made, they, they make into movies. What is a person, moment, conversation, or event that either changed the trajectory of your life or it just stands out as significant in anchoring you? Th this is a tough one as well because my, my dad has been very formidable in my life. My dad coached me. He was, he was that type of father. He has always been there like one of the people that just he, he's he's one of those people that is a great listener he is the one that changed the trajectory of my life i'd say that and it's not you know one one specific thing that happened but like when i stray and which i did stray it's like any other well a lot lots of people do he let me make my mistakes he basically grabbed me by my shirt dusted me off and helped me out is there something in particular when you say formidable? I started getting in trouble in junior high school. You know, I was a good athlete. I just strayed. I was trying to be something I wasn't. Hanging back in the 80s in Los Angeles, trying to be uh, a little thug, I guess, you know. Uh, but uh, my parents, uh, I was supposed to go to a school that was very good athletically. I was supposed to play football there. This is junior high school. Going to high school, they pulled the rug out from me and said, you know what? You get into too much trouble and you would get into trouble at that school. So they put me in another school. And my brother was part of that, you know, which I, I was so angry with all of them. I said, I'm not going to play sports anymore. That wound up being the thing that changed my life, going to the other high school. Because I was supposed to be going to a school that was pretty hardcore, and uh, I wound up going to a school that was like 90210 with kids that had a lot more than I had, and they experienced different things, and everybody had set goals of further in their lives. So I really do feel like it's true that the environment has a lot to play with how people, how they turn out. And when you're young, you're just a seed, and depending on who's dealing with you, you can grow one way or grow the other. You know, at the end, you can wind up being this beautiful flower or some weed. Uh, I feel like my high school actually did change my life. What is a moment or event that highlights for you the experience of being a Black man in America? I've had some big issues. Uh, I've been pulled over several times. As a youth, like I say, you know, I've had several run-ins with the law, and this is not something that I was out doing something bad, you know, just getting pulled over and seeing, you know, or getting hit or laying down on the concrete. It let me know real quick that I was different. The, the L.A. Sheriff and LAPD and Long Beach Police Department, they let me know I was different quickly. It's odd when I think back about that now because I, uh, I still, you know, I'm, I'm 51, soon to be 52 years old, and I'm still traumatized by, you know, when a policeman gets behind me. My heart beats, you know. That's one of the things I'm afraid for my, my sons. We always have to talk, and I know I wear them out about it, but it was tough for me. I mean, I've probably been pulled over 30, 40 times, so. Wow. Uh, I'd say, yeah, that, that was an often thing back then. And so I'm going to guess it was more frequent when you were a youth, but can I ask when was the last time you were stopped? Probably been in the last four, three or four years. Uh, nothing like it was when I was younger. In Louisiana, I haven't really been profiled, so to speak. So it's the been... California experience is the predominant. Yeah, yeah. I think I've only been profiled in Louisiana once. And like I said, I don't have speeding tickets. I don't, you know, I'm not an erratic driver. My last time getting pulled over in California, I remember I was with my brother and I had a young man that was visiting in a car. We were just driving around, just showing him LA. You know, we were in Manhattan Beach, about to make a left turn to go show him the actual beach. And this police car came with his lights just roaring. I mean, I roaring. he was coming the opposite way. He stopped and he looked at us. And I'm like, what? you know, keep looking straight. We're good. 
And, I, and mind you, I'm in college. My my mind is totally thinking I'm on another level now. You know, I'm, I'm not a thug. And so the guy leaves. He, he pulls, he goes down the street, but he comes back around and puts his lights right on us and he, he pulls us over. And, uh, oh, he's so combative. And my brother is very cocky. And I, I told my brother, I said, let me do the speaking because I know how short fuse he is. And uh, we're just going back and forth, going back and forth. And I'm thinking about to go to jail. And I, you know, I, I'm asking him, man, why did you pull me over? And he finally gives me an answer saying that there was an, uh, a robbery of a store. So I guess that's, that's my end. You know, I'm like, you start questioning. I was like, well, how many people was it? You know, well, it was two. The lady said it was two. I said, well, as you can see, there's three. Then I said, well, what kind of car? They were? It, they were driving a Honda like I was driving a Honda, but it was a different color. He, he just got short, so short views with me. And, and it, I said, I had to finally let him check my car. He knew that we didn't have any money or that any, any guns or anything like that, but it was degrading to me for the first time. You know, I mean, all the other times in my life when I was getting pulled over, I didn't know any better. But, you know, I'm a college student and thinking I know my rights now. But I don't know my rights evidently because I had to let them let me look in my car or else we'd be going to jail. So, yeah. But, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, that detail. You know, I asked those two questions, but for many people, it is the, the same thing. Like what stands out as the experience of being a black man is the interaction with law enforcement. Yeah. Which is, you know, part of what inspired this whole project because, you know, black women are pulled over, yes, but it's not in the same numbers at all. I had many, many run-ins with the police. I, I witnessed a friend of mine get hit pretty good, be, be pretty good. And uh, I've been hit, but not as hard as he was getting hit. And we were right there. They thought we had robbed the thrifties because we were eating at the, eating at the store right next to us. I've had, and when, when I hear some of your questions, there's so many things I could say, and I, I don't know if I should... Uh, venture off but you know i had a friend of mine get shot in front of me so really yeah yes yeah so. do you want to say something about it sure i mean yeah i don't mind it, it was after a football game a high school football game it was at a carl's jr all these people meet met up you know from it was a rival football game so they met at this carl's jr's it was a different neighborhood they uh, shot him you know shot him three times I didn't realize at the time that he had been shot in the back, but the first bullet went through his arm and I guess it turned him around and he shot in the back. So one of my best friends and I picked him up. He friend picked him up by the legs and I picked him up under the arms. When we got him up on the counter, I had blood all over me. I didn't realize it, it was uh, tough. It really was. And, but he, he lived and he's, he's doing well now, but uh, yeah. I, that's lived with me for quite a while. That, uh, that's a lot of violence. Yeah. I was in, like I said before, I was in Desert Storm. The feuding and the stuff that was happening in the mid-80s and early 80s of, in Los Angeles was just as volatile and, and, and crazy as what I, I was. I was in Desert Storm during, when the ground war started. Some of the injuries I've seen have been just as bad as what I saw in, in war. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. That's sad to hear. Yeah. What would you say to America if she was a woman? If some people take it as a woman that you are interested in. It could be a woman who's a friend, whatever. In whatever context that is for you, if America was a woman, what would you say to her? I love that question. Really, I set up a relationship when I, I hear that question. I, I look at my relationship with America as if I've been in a relationship with this woman that I adore and love, but she doesn't love me the same way. I don't know if you've been in a relationship where you really tried and tried to make it work, but it's, it's like you're constantly... You don't want to say too much, but you, you're pleading to make a, a relationship work. What, what, what I constantly try to say is, what can I do to let you know how much I care about you? You keep treating me a certain type of way, but I adore you. I, I love everything you stand for, but it doesn't seem like you love me the same way. And I don't know what I can do 
to gain your love. That that would be my kind of my statement that I'd say to America. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. What is love to you? I'll tell you as a man, my definition of love is listening and uh, adore. Those are two words that, or three, I should say compassion. To frame up the word love, it's one of those growing things that you can't just say you have to do. So I'm constantly trying to show people. And I tell my sons this all the time. I say, don't tell me, show me. It's not just love, of course, but if you want somebody to understand how you feel, it's, it's, it's an action word. Yeah, love is, is compassion and, and showing that that's what it is. And listening, of course. That's, that's what's gotten me through my marriage, at least. <laughs> 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 you know, a pastor in my church used to say, a man should always have the last word. And that's yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and I must say, I think listening is an underrated superpower. Yes, very much so. I get a lot of calls from people I served with or just old friends. And the majority of the time they tell me, because you listen, you don't always, you have good words to say, but yet, uh, I mean, you have good advice. You listen, you don't, you don't have to correct everything I say. Here. So I feel like I'm. Um, that's one of my attributes is I'm a good listener. So yeah. yeah. Is there anything about you that we haven't covered that hasn't come up in the interview that would challenge any of the stereotypes of black men? Challenging stereotypes has always been a big deal for me. You know, when you're young and you're walking down the street, you hear the locks go on someone's door because they think you may jump in there and rob them. That, that's always been one of my things is trying to make people feel comfortable around me. And I, I feel like that's one of those things that uh, is challenging those stereotypes. So I'm very approachable, you know, when I, at, at work. Sometimes it might be overly. I might be overdoing it because I don't want people to feel like you can't say anything to him because he's an angry black man. I, I want people, you know, to, to feel comfortable around me. And sometimes, like I said, to a fault, I'm that guy that will wave at you when I'm, I ride a bicycle. I'll ride my bicycle around and there might be a neighbor that never does wave, but I'll wave at him every time. And it upsets my wife. I say, I'm gonna keep driving. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him know that I care about him or some people don't think I'm wrong about that, but I'm just, it doesn't take any time out of my life. It's something that I do, I don't know. <laughs> And, and I hear you, I hear that it doesn't take anything away from you to do it. Right. I mean, what does it take to say hello to somebody, even if they're not going to say anything back? You know, I, I figure if I'm walking in the office and I know the, the person's not going to, maybe it makes them upset. I don't know. But it, it doesn't take anything from me, who I am. And I feel good about, I feel good about it at the end. And if they're angry, they're angry. Uh, my life is, uh, I, I feel complete. My life is good. I'm big into diversity. I have a large friendship base. I embrace men as my brothers, regardless of color, especially if you have befriended me and shown me your value in my life. I don't keep a lot of people in my life that have no value to me. I'm, I'm not talking about monetary. I'm just talking about straight up. Like if we can't have a dialogue, dialogue is a lot to me. It, it's the same thing every every time I come to you, you're talking about, you know, this woman or that. I know I, I don't need that. I, I, like I said, I value diversity and I love having people who can challenge me, give me knowledge, intellectual knowledge. Being someone who is just easy to be with, easy to talk to, but who also requires stimulation. That's what I hear. You, not yeah. interested in just, you know, just chit chatting or a complaint session, but real dialogue, a conversation that's stimulating, then you're a yes to that. Exactly. That, that's, that's in a nutshell. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people want that. I, I really, I, I think a lot of people want that engagement, but yet I think we've, we've settled for cliches, you know, how you doing, blah, blah, blah. And then it's, it's all the small talk and you make this long conversation on the small talk. I love to be able to expand my relationship with folks and be able to, like, I listen to podcasts all the time. I'm always trying to gain knowledge and uh, it's always good to be around people because you're growing. I mean, honestly, if you're not figuring, trying to do something every day, 
and get something out of every day that makes you a better person or uh, challenges you some way, what's the point? I mean, every day I learn something different. Every day. And I make it a point to. I really challenge everybody to at least learn something. I mean, a new word or even visually what the flower looked like one day compared to what it looks like the day before. Just notice things. Open your eyes and uh, learn. As I listen to you, I wrote a few books about actions to take towards compassion, like to grow the, the spirit of compassion with designated actions, right? The days are things like, you know, notice, listen. And as I'm listening to you, as you are the epitome of what that book is about, which is your life just being joy and it not costing you anything to say hello to someone who still hasn't waved yet. That yeah. is, yeah, that is a high level of compassion that you're living. The things that you're talking about, they're not taught anywhere. Unfortunately, and this is my personal perception, it's not the truth, but I think in our communities that are still struggling, there's an absence of these very things being taught. The, the folks who didn't get that are then raising folks who don't get that. And so then they're stuck yeah. versus having access to these life skills that aren't just about, you know, how to save your money and all that, but we don't acknowledge that the diverse actions that make up compassion, that that is life skill. Like that is life skill. So right. Right. as we've had this conversation, is there anything that you're now present to aware of or something that you're taking away from having had this conversation? Yes. The, the, what I got out of for me was that I still struggle, you know, I, I still get emotional when I talk about certain things. I see a healing process and actually letting it come out of my mouth. The words come out of my mouth when I speak certain uh, pains. I have been diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder for the Army. I've learned certain things, but the more I start to let things out, I feel like there's a healing process that's the world is better, you know, for me. I feel like... Uh, Life is, there's life on the other side. I get so much out of these interviews. Even though it's the same question, it doesn't matter because each person is so unique. I'm talking to my cousin. You know, this is a cousin that we've had, what, a handful of conversations? Uh -huh. I am so present to your love of family and what you've built because of your understanding of what's possible with family. It's an amazing example, and I think I don't think it's possible for a listener to have heard this interview and not be present to love. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. And uh, I tell you, my dad never knew his dad. And he, his mom died when he was very young. And so he has an older brother. And they had role models of uncles. But I hear all these stories about how since, you know, this person didn't have their father, they're, they're not going to be anything. And my father has been like the best dad without seeing this role model of a dad come home every day. If I can I grow up, I'm 51. <laughs> if I can be a quarter of what he is, I feel like I'm doing okay. Thank you for listening. As you can hear, you do not want to miss any of these brothers. Make sure you subscribe. You can find more at our website, 365brothers.com, 365 brothers. Com. This is Robin Shine. To listen is to love.